but they were patriots because they didn't just get excited at a rally and sign a petition. They followed through on the commitment they made. History says not one of those guys backed down when they watched their homes go up in smoke, watched their sons die in the war, gave every penny they had, some of them millionaires dying in debtor's prison. Uh, they gave it all. Nine of them did not survive to see the freedom that they birthed for you and I. They made incredible sacrifices so that you and I could be free. And what are we doing to honor that sacrifice today? What are we doing to make sure that that freedom survives for another generation? Lives, fortunes, and sacred honor, folks. You and I are asked to give our lives, a little bit of our time, our fortunes, a little bit of our money maybe to participate in the process, support groups that believe the way that you, you believe, to, to be able to get out sacred honor. You step up and speak your mind, people are going to say things about you you don't like. That's part of the process. Lives, fortunes, sacred honor. Here's what I'm challenging you to do tonight. Number one, I'm not going to ask you to do what a president might have to ask you to do. And if we're attacked, again, I have a feeling you have a president come on television, whoever it is, and say, we need help. We need volunteers. We don't have enough troops. Most of us in this room, hopefully, would stand up and say, I'm willing to die for freedom. I'm willing to die to make sure that the next generation enjoys the freedoms that I've been able to enjoy. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm asking you to live the freedom that others have died so that you and I can enjoy it. Uh, James Garfield, uh, President of the United States, also a minister of the gospel, by the way, another atheist uh, guy involved in our government, uh, he said, now more than ever before, the people are responsible for the character of their Congress. If that body be ignorant, reckless, and corrupt, it's because the people tolerate ignorance, recklessness, and corruption. If it be intelligent, brave, and pure, it's because the people demand these high qualities to represent them in the national legislature. If the next centennial is not fine as a great nation, it will be because those who represent the enterprise, the culture, and the morality of the nation do not aid in controlling the political forces. That's our job. We've got to participate. Consent of the government. Let's not be cynical and step out of the process. Let's be in the process. Let's vote. Make sure our voice is heard. Uh, if you don't think your vote counts, guys, election night, 1998, when I ran, 30,000 people voted in my race. I lost by 20 votes. 20 votes. I, mean, I don't know about around here, back in Texas, that's, a, that's just one decent-sized homeschool family. You know, it's just not a lot of votes. So 20 votes. There's not one person in this room that couldn't go out and win 20 votes for the candidate of your choice. Now, fortunately, and by the way, this was 1998. If you grew up here in Florida, you remember the 2000 election. Well, in 1998, we had a little recount in my race, and I ended up winning by 36 votes. I got this great call right after the recount. It's the governor's office. They said, uh, Representative Lake Green, we've got Governor Bush on the phone. Can you take his call? <laughs> well, time, yes, of course. So I take the call. He gets on the phone. He says, Rick, he says, you did it the hard way. Recount and everything. He said, I'm dubbing you Landslide Green. <laughs> <laughs> he thought that was real funny in 1998. <laughs> then your election came in in 2000, and man never laughed about a recount again, I promise you. <laughs> but think about even that race in 2000. What was it, 537, 557, whatever the, the difference was here in Florida. 500-something votes to determine president of the United States? Your vote counts. Make sure that you go out and vote and let your voice be heard. Volunteer for candidates that believe like you, contribute to them, speak out, get educated on these things so you can speak out about them. Listen to our program, Wild Voters Live. Uh, we talk every week about these issues going on, and on Fridays we do what we call Good News Friday, where we talk about victories in the culture war, uh, places where we're getting back to a strict constructionist view, places where we're getting back to what the founding fathers originally intended. Uh, pass the torch. Actually, in this room, I should be saying receive the torch. Uh, Danny's been in this program. It's called Patriot Academy. It's what he was talking about earlier. You get to live at the Capitol there in Austin, Texas uh, for four days and actually uh, debate with real estate reps and uh, learn a biblical worldview uh, of government, a founding father's worldview of government. You learn to uh, speaking skills, media skills, all kinds of great things. If you're interested in talking to me or Danny uh, after the presentation tonight. So live your freedom and pass the torch. Make sure you're participating and what's going on. This guy right here, I think, is the example for how to participate in the political realm because it is a very frustrating place to be. Uh, John Quincy Adams was obviously president of the United States, but he's the only guy ever to serve as president to then go home and run for Congress. Does anybody in this room know why he ran for Congress? Why would he go home after being the man and then go home to be one of today what would be 435? Anybody, help me out. Does he hate it being president? I can't hear you, I'm sorry. He, can't, he hated being president. <laughs> well, that would be a good reason, but no, yeah, there was an issue that he, that he cared very deeply about and that he devoted his life to. Slavery. He wanted to end slavery. He gets elected to Congress, a pro-slavery Congress, and he's hitting his head against the wall. He's not getting anywhere. Man, he's filing bill after bill, petition after petition. He brings petitions from all over the country. I mean, most congressmen would only bring petitions from their district. He was bringing hundreds and hundreds 
from all over the country to get rid of slavery. Pro-slavery Congress, they're sick and tired of hearing John Quincy Adams talking about getting rid of slavery. So they passed the John Quincy gag order rule. They say, Monday's still petition day. You can come on Monday and file any petition you want as long as it's not an anti-slavery uh, petition. So he gets, gets kind of shut up. They don't want him talking about it anymore. Year after year, this continues. Thirteen years serving in Congress, beating his head against the wall, not accomplishing his agenda one bit. A reporter comes to him and says, what's the point? Why are you doing this? You're not getting anywhere. He said, duty is ours. Results are God's. He said, I'm just doing my duty. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do, and I'll leave the results to God. I've got peace in that knowing. It may not be me. It may be somebody else. So did slavery end in his lifetime? No. Four years later, he dies in Congress right there on the floor of the House of Representatives. But for one two-year term, a young man came in and served with him. They became very good friends. In fact, this young man became so close to him, the young man was a pallbearer at John Quincy Adams' funeral. And John Quincy Adams, during that two years, kind of did a brain dump into him, became a mentor to him. And that young man went home to run for re-election and lost. He ran for another election and lost. Ran for another election and lost. And many other times. He didn't win another election until about 15 years later. He was elected president of the United States. It was Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln implemented the very plan that John Quincy Adams had been trying to implement for 17 years in Congress. The point being, we have no idea what impact our actions are going to have on the process. We do our duty. We leave the results up to God. Uh, these guys right here, from my last story, Danny, I think you wanted me to take some questions. So uh, these guys right here really are uh, what I'm asking you to be today, the Lexington men and men of the day, willing to step up and participate in your government, be a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. These guys were willing to step up, even though they weren't a well-trained army, they were a thrown-together militia. It was April 19, 1775, the morning after Paul Revere's ride. Seventy-seven Minutemen lined up on that Lexington Green. They were black and white. They were men and boys. They were all out of the same church. It was literally a pastor and his parishioners. They lined up on that Lexington Green and uprise Major Pitt Caron. Pitt Caron's got six companies of British infantry. That's 800 men. 800 fall into position a mere 150 feet from our 77 with these words from Pitt Caron. He said, disperse you rebels, disperse you villains, lay down your arms. Our Captain Parker, he walked up and down that line of 77 and he said this. He said, don't fire unless fired upon. But if they mean to have war, let it begin here. And then that shot heard around the world was fired. I'm here to tell you that's where your freedom and my freedom began. If we're going to experience that freedom in our lifetimes, if our children and grandchildren are going to experience it, it's got to begin right here. We've got to be willing to go back to the foundational principles that our founding fathers gave us. They did found this nation as one nation under God. There's no question about their faith and what they intended for the principles of this nation to be. For 45 years, we've made an attempt to move away from those principles. We've seen dramatic increases in crime, and every negative statistic you want, it's gone up. The only thing that's gone down is our SAT scores. Uh, if, uh, you, know, you can look at the comparison of education, uh, educational systems that still do what the Founding Fathers wanted to take the Northwest Ordinance, for instance, where uh, they said you got to have schools, and your schools have to teach religion, morality, knowledge. That's the order they put it in. Uh, schools that still do that score dramatically better than the schools that have removed all values from the system. The point being, what they put in place works. We want our nation to continue to be successful. We'll return to those incredibly successful revolutionary strategies of our founding fathers. Be glad to answer any questions you have. Yes, ma'am. Um, how important is Christianity even if a Christian president is elected? Even if a Christian president is elected or isn't? Is. Is? Well, it's vitally important up and down the line. I mean, you, the, import, the importance of it is the principles that come along with it. See, in other words, what, what folks like me get accused of foolishly and wrong and, and obviously not reading the things that we write is that we want a theocracy, that we want uh, to, to, you know, to, to come in and have a theocracy. Nothing could be further from the truth. If you look at true freedom, where it's experienced the most, it's in Christian nations. You try going to, for instance, a Muslim nation and living any other faith but Islam. Here in America, a Christian nation, you can live any faith that you want because of the Christian principles. You just go trace it right back to the Bible. There's a marketplace of ideas. Even the prophets believed in that and believed in allowing other people. You get all the time you want to speak out however you're 